Preface Adoption of the word Gemba has lagged behind adoption of the Kaizen concept in the world. This is unfortunate but understandable. Being present on the Gemba can be a greater mindset and behavior change than simply doing Kaizen. The Cambridge Business English Dictionary is one of a few sources, as of November 2011, to give the definition of Gemba as an English word. Gemba, noun. Of Gem, noun. In Japanese business theory, the place where things happen in manufacturing used to say that people whose job is to manufacture products are in a good place to make improvements in the manufacturing process. This definition captures the spirit of Gemba as it pertains to Kaizen, but we must first understand Gemba in its broader context beyond manufacturing. The meaning of Gemba is real place in Japanese language, which is actually a place which is known to host real action. This word is extensively used in spoken Japanese language, so in live TV reporting for an earthquake, this word is used when the reporting is meant to be telecasted from the scene itself. Hence, all sorts of crime scene, film location, workplace, excavation site, meeting place, etc. can all be referred to as Gemba a place where facts and evidences can be found. But from business perspective, the customer satisfaction derived out of the value added services is the ones which are referred to as Gemba. So, in Japan, Gemba is a popular a word as Kaizen is. Not only that, experts of Japanese business sector opinion that both these words have greater significance in business parlance as well, so much so that important business decisions are taken based on the understanding of a manager's respective Gemba. Any business operation practices three activities to maximize their profit, without which they don't exist, and they are to develop, produce, and sell. And in broader sense, Gemba forms the common ground of all these three major activities wherein they occur. In this present project, we will use the word in this narrower context because these sites have been one of the business arenas most neglected by management. Managers seem to overlook the workplace as a means to generate revenue and they usually place far more emphasis on such sectors as financial management, marketing and sales and product development. When management focuses on the Gemba or work sites, they discover opportunities for making the company far more successful and profitable. In many service sectors, the Gemba is where the customers come into contact with the services offered. In the hotel business, for instance, Gemba is everywhere. In the lobby, the dining room, guest rooms, the reception desk, the check-in counters and the concierge station. At banks, the tellers are working in the Gemba, as are the loan officers receiving applicants. Most departments in these service companies have internal customers with whom they have interdepartmental activity, which also represents the Gemba. A telephone call to a general manager, production manager or quality manager at a Japanese plant is likely to get a response from the manager's assistant to the effect that he is out at the Gemba. Introduction In or at the Gemba Customer satisfying value is added to the product or service that enables the company to survive and prosper. Figure 1 places Gemba at the top of the organization, showing its importance to the company. The regular management layers, top management, middle management, engineering staff and supervisors exist to provide the necessary support to the work site. For that matter, Gemba should be the site of all improvements and the source of all information. Therefore, management must maintain close contact with the realities of the Gemba in order to solve whatever problems arise there. To put it differently, whatever assistance management provides should start from the specific needs of the worksite. When management does not respect and appreciate the Gemba, it tends to dump its instructions, designs and other supporting services, instructions, designs, often in complete disregard of actual requirements. Figure 1. In this view of Gemba management relations, management's role is to provide support to the Gemba, which is seen as being at the top of management structure. Management exists to help the Gemba do a better job by reducing constraints as much as possible. In reality, however, wonder how many managers correctly understand their role. 
More often than not, managers regard the Gemba as a failure source, where things always go wrong, and they neglect their responsibility for those problems. Sometimes management even appears afraid of the plant and seems almost lost or helpless. Even in places where the union does not exercise a firm grip, Gemba work is left to veteran supervisors who are allowed by management to run the show as they please. In such cases, management has lost control of the workplace. Subsequent chapters will discuss in depth what management of the Gemba really means. Supervisors should play a key role in Gemba management, and yet they often lack the basic training to manage or to do their most important job, maintaining and improving the standards and achieving quality, cost and delivery. Eric Machels, who came to Japan from Europe as a young student to learn about Japanese management practices, was placed in a Japanese automotive assembly plant as an operator. Comparing his experience there with his previous experience in European Gemba, Machels observed much more intense communication between management and operators in Japan, resulting in a much more effective two-way information flow between them. Workers had a much clearer understanding of management expectations and of their own responsibilities in the whole Kaizen process. The resulting constructive tension on the work floor made the work much more challenging in terms of meeting management expectations and giving workers a higher sense of pride in their work. Maintaining Gemba at the top of the management structure requires committed employees. Workers must be inspired to fulfill their roles, to feel proud of their jobs, and to appreciate the contribution they make to their company and society. Instilling a sense of mission and pride is an integral part of management's responsibility for their Gemba. This approach contrasts sharply with perceptions of Gemba, figure 2, that regard it as a place where things always go wrong, a source of failure and customer complaints. In Japan, production-related work is sometimes referred to as 3K, signifying the Japanese words for dangerous, kikan, dirty, kitanai, and difficult, kitsui. Once upon a time, the Gemba was a place that good managers avoided. Being assigned a position at, or close to the Gemba, amounted to a career dead end. Today, in contrast, the presidents of some better-known Japanese companies have rich backgrounds in Gemba areas. They possess a good understanding of what goes on in the Gemba and provide support accordingly. Figure 2. In this view of Gemba management relations, management's role is to manage Gemba by providing policies and resources. The two opposite views of the Gemba, as sitting on top of the management structure, inverted triangle, and as sitting at the bottom of the management structure, normal triangle, are equally valid in terms of Gemba management relations. Gemba and management share an equally important place, the Gemba by providing the product or service that satisfies the customer and management by setting strategy and deploying policy to achieve that goal in the Gemba. Thus, the thrust for improvement should be both bottom-up and top-down. In Figure 2, management stays on top of the organization. It takes the initiative in establishing policies, targets and priorities and in allocating resources such as manpower and money. In this model, management must exercise leadership and determine the kind of Kaizen most urgently needed. This process of achieving corporate objectives is called policy deployment. Because of their attachment to the Gemba management relationship, as shown in the regular triangle figure 2, many, manage many managers tend to believe that their job is always to tell the Gemba what to do. However, by looking at the inverted triangle figure 1, showing Gemba at the top, managers can see that they should listen to and learn from employees of the Gemba in order to provide appropriate help. Gemba becomes the source of achieving common sense, low-cost improvements. The respective roles of management and Gemba in these two models never should be confused. Assistant Professor Takeshi Kawase of Keio University writes in Solving Industrial Engineering Problems, People within a company can be divided into two groups, those who earn money and those who don't. Only those frontline people who develop, produce and sell products are earning money for the company. The ideal company would have only one person who does not earn money, the president, leaving the rest of the employees directly involved in revenue-generating activity. The people who do not earn money are those who sit on top of the money earners, all employees with titles such as chief, 
head or manager, including the president and all staff, and spanning areas that include personnel, finance, advertising, quality and industrial engineering. No matter how hard these people may work, they do not directly earn money for the company. For this reason, they might be better referred to as dependents. If money earners stop work for one second, the company's chances of making money will be lost by one second. The trouble is that non-money earners often think that they know better and are better qualified than money earners because they are better educated. They often make the job of the latter more difficult. Non-money earners may think, without us, they cannot survive, when they should be thinking, what can we do to help them do their job better without us? If we say, the customer is king, we should say, the gemba is Buddha. Historically, the corporate staff played a leading role in regard to the gemba. The staff was accountable for achieving greater efficiency by providing guidance for gemba people to follow. The shortcoming of this system is the separation between those who pass down directives and those who carry them out. The new approach should be what we might call a Gemba-centered approach, where Gemba is accountable not only for production, but also for quality and cost and personnel assist from the sidelines. The following are the conditions for successful implementation of a Gemba-centered approach. Gemba management must accept accountability for achieving quality, cost and delivery. QCD. Gemba must be allowed enough elbow room for Kaizen. Management should provide the target for the Gemba to achieve but should be accountable for the outcome. Also, management should assist the Gemba in achieving the target. Needs of the Gemba are more easily identified by the people working there. Solutions grounded in reality can be obtained. Solutions emphasize common sense and low-cost approaches rather than expensive and method-oriented approaches. People begin to enjoy Kaizen and are readily inspired. Kaizen awareness and work efficiency can be enhanced simultaneously. Workers can think about Kaizen while working. It is not always necessary to gain upper management's approval to make changes. The benefits of a Gemba-centered approach are many. Chapter 1 The Kaizen Story the Kaizen story is a standardized format to record Kaizen activities conducted by such small group activities as quality circles. The same standardized format is also employed to report Kaizen activities conducted by staff and managers. The Kaizen story follows the Plan Do Check Act PDCA cycle. Step 1 through 4 relates to P, Plan. Step 5 relates to D, Do. Step 6 relates to C, check, and steps 7 and 8 relate to A, act. The Kaizen story format helps anybody to solve problems based on data analysis. One of its merits is to help managers visualize and communicate the problem-solving process. It is also an effective way to keep records of Kaizen activities. Various problem-solving tools are often shown in the Kaizen story to help the reader understand the process. The Kaizen story includes the following standardized steps. First, selecting the theme. The story begins with the reason why the particular theme was selected. Often the themes are determined in line with management policies or depend on the priority, importance, urgency or economics of current circumstances. Second, understanding the current status and setting objectives. Before starting the project, current conditions must be understood and reviewed. One way to do this is to go to the Gemba and follow the five Gemba principles. Another way is to collect data. Third, analyzing the data thus collected to identify root causes. Fourth, establishing countermeasures based on the data analysis. Fifth, implementing countermeasures. Sixth, confirming the effects of the countermeasures. Seventh, establishing or revising the standards to prevent recurrence. Eighth, reviewing the preceding process and working on the next steps. For an example of a Kaizen story, see the case study Kaizen Experience at Alpargatas. The Toyota Business Practice The standard problem-solving story at Toyota. Many companies have their own so-called standard way of solving problems. 
Some have adopted the Kaizen story approach just shown. Some follow a nearly identical step-by-step -step approach called Kopetsu Kaizen, most popular within Total Productive Maintenance, TPM, and others have adopted the 8D approach from the automotive industry. It is found that many times a standard exits but is not used in the true meaning of a standard, a method to be followed, improved and revised. Today, the so-called A3 problem-solving method has become increasingly popular. The A3 refers only to the paper size that is the standard for summarizing the problem-solving story. The A3 problem-solving approach comes from Toyota, is based on the Kaizen story and follows an eight-step approach. In an effort to standardize and strengthen problem-solving as Toyota operations became increasingly globalized, in the early 2000s, the Toyota business practice, TBP, was born. The eight steps of the TBP problem-solving approach are First, clarify the problem. Second, break down the problem. Third, set a target to be achieved. Fourth, analyze the root cause. Fifth, develop countermeasures. Sixth, see countermeasures through. Seventh, evaluate both results and process. Eighth, standardize successful processes. A TBP approach can seem very simple and quite similar to other eight-step approaches. As with many methodologies in Kaizen, knowing a few simple key points and practicing them diligently makes a difference. See Figure 1.2 Figure 1.2 The Eight-Step Toyota Business Practice TBP Approach to Problem Solving Chris Schrand is a serial consultant from the Kaizen Institute with over 30 years of experience in the field of quality. Ten of those years he spent at Toyota Motor Manufacturing Kentucky as quality engineering manager, during which he wrote thousands of A3 problem-solving documents. Chris shared some lessons learned from teaching the TBP approach to a wide variety of manufacturing and service companies after leaving Toyota. About the typical approach to A3 and TBP problem-solving, Chris shares, Not enough importance is placed on the problem statement itself. It must measurably define the gap between the current situation and the target condition. The problem statement must contain neither a cause nor a countermeasure. The more time spent getting the problem statement right, the less time will be needed to actually address the problem. There are many tools and methods for root cause analysis, but the one you must know and use is 5 Whys analysis. It is a simple and powerful tool, much like a chainsaw, and must be used properly and logically to arrive at potential root causes. The properly written problem-solving story connects the problem statement through the root cause analysis to the countermeasure action plan. The A3 should make sense read backwards or forwards. It can't be repeated enough that the A3 is not a worksheet or a form. It is a logical story that contains thoughts about each phase of plan, do, check, act, etc., even if these are in advance of the investigation. People want a formula, a template to fill out to arrive at the answer. Resist the temptation to turn A3 thinking into a form-filling exercise. The news is filled with so many companies that fail to follow their own standards or to adhere to their own problem-solving process. This is true even of Toyota. Once, Chris Schrand was asked why so many companies fail to consistently follow a standardized approach to problem-solving. He replied, If a management team is too busy putting out many fires daily, this will distract from problem-solving of any kind. Many times they are working on too many things, the wrong things. They have jumped to solutions rather than followed a problem-solving approach. Sometimes, even after sorting and applying Pareto analysis to the issues, none clearly stand out as the vital few things that need to be done to put out many fires. So we throw money at all of them. Instead, the team that follows a standard problem-solving approach will be able to start with the recurring problems that they believe they had already countermeasured, putting safeguards and standards in place. Problem recurrence indicates either that the problem recurred because of a different root cause, the standards put in place were not followed, or they did not actually get to the true root cause the first time. Sorting out how many of what types of problems a management team is tackling says a great deal about the organization's problem-solving skills and all discipline to adhere to standards. There is no doubt 
that what we see at Toyota is the result of many years of experiments, both successful and failed. We must adopt best practices such as these, adapt them to our situation, and do Gemba Kaizen to build standards in our own way. Chapter 2 5S Five Steps of Workplace Organization Figure 2.2 shows the relationship of the five steps of 5S and how self-discipline and continual improvement is central to this approach. Figure 2.2, the five steps of 5S. Seri, sort. The first step of housekeeping, Seri, entails classifying items in the Gemba into two categories, necessary and unnecessary, and discarding or removing the latter from the Gemba. A ceiling on the number of necessary items should be established. All sorts of objects can be found in the Gemba. A close look reveals that only a small number of them are needed in daily work. Many others either will never be used or will be needed only in the distant future. The Gemba is full of unused machines, jigs, dies and tools, rejects, work in process, raw materials, supplies and parts, shelves, containers, desks, workbenches, files of documents, cards, racks, pallets and other items. An easy rule of thumb is to remove anything that will not be used within the next 30 days. Seiri often begins with a red tag campaign. Select one area of the Gemba as the site for Seiri. Members of the designated 5S team go to the Gemba with handfuls of red tags and place them on items they believe are unnecessary. The larger the red tags and the greater their number, the better. When it is unclear whether or not a particular item is needed, a red tag should be placed on it. By the end of the campaign, the area may be covered with hundreds of red tags, inviting comparison with the grove of maple trees in the fall. Sometimes, Gemba employees may find red tags placed on items they actually need. In order to keep such items, employees must demonstrate the necessity of doing so. Otherwise, everything with a red tag on it is removed from the Gemba. Things that have no reason to stay in the Gemba, no apparent future usage and no intrinsic value, are thrown away. Things that will not be needed within the next 30 days but may be needed at some point in the future are moved to their rightful places, such as the warehouse in the case of supplies. Work in process that exceeds the needs of the Gemba should be sent either to the warehouse or back to the process responsible for producing the surplus. In the process of Seiri, one can obtain valuable insights into how the company conducts its business. The red tag campaign leaves in its wake a mountain of unnecessary gambutsu, and employees are confronted with uncomfortable questions such as how much money is tied up in prematurely manufactured products. People ask themselves how they could have acted so foolishly. At one company, a red tag campaign unearthed enough supplies to last for 20 years. Both managers and operators have to see such extravagance in the Gemba to believe it. This is a practical way for managers to get a glimpse at how people work. On finding a heap of supplies, for example, the manager should be asking, what kind of system do we have for placing orders to suppliers? What kind of information do our purchasing people use in placing orders? What kind of communication is maintained between production scheduling and production? Or do the staff responsible for purchasing just place orders when they think it is about time to do so? Managers should be equally rigorous when they find work in process made well in advance. Why do our people keep producing work in process for which we have no immediate need? Based on what kind of information do they start production? Such a situation indicates fundamental deficiencies in the system, such as having insufficient control between production and purchasing at the Gempa. It also shows insufficient flexibility to cope with changes in production scheduling. At the end of the Red Tag campaign, all managers, including the president and plant manager as well as Gemba managers, should get together and have a good look at the heap of supplies, work in process and other Gembutsu and start making Kaizen to correct the system that made this waste possible. Eliminating unnecessary items via the Red Tag campaign also frees up space, enhancing flexibility in the use of the work area, because once unnecessary items have been discarded, only what is needed remains.
At this stage, the maximum number of items to be left in the gemba, parts and supplies, work in process, and so on, must be determined. Seiri can be applied to individuals working in offices as well. For example, a typical desk has two or more drawers. Items are often placed in these drawers indiscriminately. Side by side in a single drawer, one may find not only pencils, ballpoint pens, erasers, writing pads, rubber pans, business cards and scissors, but also toothbrushes, candy, perfume, aspirin, coins, matches, cigars, costume jewellery, band-aids and other objects. These items first must be classified by use. In a desk with only two drawers, office supplies and personal items each should occupy one drawer. Next, the maximum number of each item is determined. For instance, let's say we decide to place in the drawers only two pencils, one ballpoint pen, one eraser, one pad of paper, and so on. Any items beyond the maximum number are discarded, that is, removed from the drawer and taken to the office supply storage area in the corner of the room. Sometimes this storage area is called a recycling bank. When supplies in the drawers are exhausted, the employee goes to the recycling bank to replenish them. In turn, the employee in charge of the bank watches the inventory and when it drops to the designated minimum, orders more supplies. By pairing to a minimum the supplies in our office drawers, we eliminate the need to shuffle through the collection of pencils, papers and cosmetics to reach a desired item. This process develops self-discipline as well as improving record-keeping and enhancing employees' ability to work effectively. Satan, straighten. Once Seiri has been carried out, all unnecessary items have been removed from Gemba, leaving only the minimum number needed. But these needed items, such as tools, can be of no use if they are stored too far from the workstation or in a place where they cannot be found. This brings us to the next stage of 5S, Satan. Satan means classifying items by use and arranging them accordingly to minimize search time and effort. To do this, each item must have a designated name, address and volume. Not only the location, but also the maximum number of items allowed in the Gemba must be specified. For example, work in process cannot be produced in unlimited quantities. Instead, the floor space for the boxes containing the work must be delineated clearly by painting a rectangle to mark off the area, etc. And a maximum allowable number of boxes, say five, must be designated. A weight may be suspended from the ceiling above the boxes to make it impossible to stack more than five. When the maximum allowed level of inventory has been reached, the production in the previous process must stop. There is no need to produce more than what the following process can consume. In this manner, Satan ensures the flow of a minimum number of items in the Gemba from station to station on a first-in, first-out basis. Taiki Ono was once invited to visit the assembly line of another company. Asked to comment on the line, he said, You have much too much work in process waiting by the line side. Leave a minimum number on the line side and send back all the excessive items to the previous process. A mountain of pressed metal sheets had to be sent back to the press shop and the workers there had to do their job surrounded by pressed metal sheets that created a prison-like atmosphere. Ono said, this is the best way to show people that the harder they work, the more money the company will lose. The items left in the gemba should be placed in the designated area. In other words, each item should have its own address, and conversely, each space in the gemba also should have its designated address. Each wall should be numbered using designations such as wall A1 and wall B2. The location of such items as supplies, work in process, fire hydrants, tools, jigs, moulds and carts should be designated either by its address or by special markings. Markings on the floor or workstations indicate the proper locations of work in process, tools and so on. Painting a rectangle on the floor to delineate the area for boxes containing work in process, for example, creates a space sufficient to store the maximum volume of items. At the same time, any deviation from the designated number of boxes shows up instantly. Readers familiar with Just-in-Time will recognize that this is the first stage of introducing a pool production system. Tools should be placed well within reach and be easy to pick up and put down. 
their silhouettes might be painted on the surface where they are supposed to be stored. This makes it easy to tell when they are in use. The hallway also should be marked clearly with paint. Just as other spaces are designated for supplies and work in process, the hallway is meant for transit. Nothing should be left there. The hallway should be completely clear so that any object left there will stand out, allowing supervisors to notice the abnormality instantly and take remedial action. Chapter 3 Quality Management The Gemba confronts quality issues from a different angle than upstream management. While upstream management requires sophisticated tools such as design reviews, design of experiments, value analysis, value engineering and the various tools of QFD, many problems in the Gemba relate to simple matters such as workmanship and handling the difficulties and variations that come up every day, e.g. inadequate working standards and operators' careless mistakes. In order to reduce variability, management must establish standards, build self-discipline among employees to maintain standards, and make certain that no defects are passed on to the next customer. Most quality problems can be solved using Gemba Gembutsu principles, the common sense, low-cost approach explained in depth. Management must introduce teamwork among operators because the operator's involvement is a key issue. Statistical Quality Control, SQC, is often employed effectively in the GEMPA, but SQC is a tool to confine the variability of the processes and will work well only if everybody, particularly management, understands the concept of variability control and makes an effort to practice it. Once during a visit to a plant, found the manager was proud of her achievement of SQC. Many control charts posted on the walls in her room were visible. But once stepped into the Gemba, it was known that nobody understood variability. The operators had no standards, and they did their jobs differently with each piece they assembled. Sometimes they didn't even have a designated place for assembly work. During my visit, machines broke down repeatedly and many rejects were produced. Yet this manager was proud of her SQC. The landmark case of line assembly quality improvement on the despoldering process at Yokogawa Hewlett Packard, YHP, in which the company succeeded in reducing the failure rate from 4,000 to 3 parts per million (ppm) between 1978 and 1982, may well illustrate his point. YHP's history of quality improvement is divided into two periods, 1978 to 1979 and 1980 to 1982. Quality improvement activities differed considerable during the two periods. During the first phase, for example, YHP took such actions as improving working standards, collecting and analyzing data on defects, introducing jigs for better control of the process, providing worker training, encouraging quality circle activities, and reducing careless mistakes by operators. To do this, YHP assembled a project team of GEMBA supervisors and production engineers to collect data, train quality circle members and provide technical assistance in such areas as jig construction. These actions helped to drive the failure rate down to 40 ppm from its previous level of 4000 ppm. See Figure 3.2 Figure 3.2 Process Quality Improvement Phase 1 once the 40 ppm level had been reached, YHP needed to step up and refine these activities if it wanted to continue its momentum and make further gains. See figure 3.3. At the same time, it had to apply new technologies, revise engineering standards, improved PC board designs and production layout. It also needed to redesign its equipment as well as its layout, incorporating the just-in-time concepts. All the while, YHP's quality circles maintained their activities to gain a better understanding of the process. They also contributed greatly to the continuous improvement of the process. As a result, YHP reached the level of 3 ppm in 1982. Figure 3.3 Process Quality Improvement Phase 2 Generally speaking, as long as the quality level remains in the percentile figures, companies can achieve dramatic improvement through such basic activities as reviewing the standards, housekeeping, collecting data on rejects, and conducting group activities for problem solving. First, review existing procedures, asking such questions as, do we have standards? 
What about housekeeping 5S in the Gemba? How much Mada exists in the Gemba? Then begin taking action. For example, implement the five Gemba principles. Train employees to be committed to never send rejects on the next process. Encourage group activities and suggestions for problem solving. Start collecting data to gain a better understanding of the nature of the problems and solve them. Start making simple jigs and tools to make the job easier and its results more reliable. These down-to-earth activities alone should reduce reject rates to a tenth their original levels. When these fundamentals are lacking, the variables are so large that sophisticated technologies do little to improve the process. Only after the basic variables have been addressed are the more challenging applications of SQC and other sophisticated approaches cost-effective. Dr. Kaoru Ishikawa's axiom, the next process is the customer, refers to the internal customer within the same company. One should never inconvenience the customers in the next process by sending rejects to them. At the Gemba, such a state of mind is often referred to as don't accept defects, don't make defects, and don't pass on defects. When everybody subscribes to and lives by this philosophy, a good QA system exists. Conclusion Today, it has come almost a must for any company to apply for national or international certification of standards such as ISO 9000, QS 9000 and AS 9000 or the environmental standards such as ISO 14000 if they are to stay in business and gain the confidence of their major global customers. These certification programs place much emphasis on standardization of the key processes and continual improvement. In Kaizen terms, the standards are the best way to do the job and Gemba Kaizen such as Mada Elimination and Housekeeping, 5S in particular, should proceed writing the standard. Writing down the working process of the Gemba as it is now in great deal, as it is now in great detail, may be required for certifying the process but is useless if the current process contains much Mada and variability. Once standards have been established, improvement of those standards must follow. Thus, it is imperative that Gemba Kaizen activities be carried out before applying for certification, as well as upgrading the standards after the certification has been awarded. Sometimes, an executive preparing for certification of ISO 9000 or QS 9000 will say, we are too busy preparing for the certification and have no time to do Kaizen. Nothing can be further from the truth. Unless Kaizen is carried out concurrently, the ensuing standards, with much variability owing to a lack of good housekeeping and mud elimination, will be just a piece of paperwork far removed from the Gemba and rarely practiced in daily work and will have no positive impact on improvement of the company's performance. Thus, Gemba Kaizen should become an integral part of getting international certification and after having received it, Gemba Kaizen should be a means to upgrade such standards on a continual basis. One of the Kaizen consultants once shared his first encounter with the magic power of standardization as follows. In 1961, as a manager for a large electronics company in Europe, was bestowed upon the responsibility for transferring know-how and delivering machines from our factory to a Japanese electronics company with which we had a joint venture agreement. Before we delivered the equipment, the Japanese company sent four operators into our factory to study our production process where twenty fully automated lines were running on three shifts. Each line produced two thousand semiconductor diodes per hour, with a yield of ninety-eight percent. About six months after the Japanese plant had begun operations, we received a letter from them thanking us for our cooperation and for the precision of our machinery. They also noted that their yield was ninety-nine point two percent. As a result, we went to Japan to study what had been done, asking our Japanese colleague, what changes did you make to realize this high yield? His answer, We made a study of your gemba and observed that you are following 60 different procedures, 20 lines working on three shifts. We discussed this, and with mutual consent from the gemba observers who had gone to your country, we decided on the best way to standardize the process. The recurring theme of this discussion has been that improving quality and reducing cost are compatible objectives. In fact, quality is the foundation on which both cost and delivery can be built. Without creating a firm system to ensure quality, there can be no hope of building effective cost management and delivery systems.
Not only is it possible both to improve quality and to reduce cost, but we must do both in order to meet today's customer requirements. Take, for example, international competition in the high-end consumer goods market. Suppose that one company subscribes the old philosophy that better quality costs more money. The company's major means of ensuring quality has been to buy more expensive machines and testing equipment and hire more people to perform rework and inspections. The company has a reputation for world-class quality, but its prices are very high. Suppose that a new company emerges as a competitor. This company believes that better quality and lower cost are compatible and has succeeded in building a product of equal or better quality to the first company, but at a lower price. How will the first company cope with its new rival? This is the real nature of the clear and present danger facing many of today's companies that continue to subscribe to the outdated notion that quality costs money. The simultaneous realization of QCD is the task that the Kaizen-minded manager must tackle in today's competitive environment. At a time when customers are demanding ever better QCD, management must emphasize the proper priority to achieve all three. Quality first. Resist the temptation to cut costs at the expense of quality and do not sacrifice quality for delivery. About Infrabooks Infrabooks delivers up to the minute information covering everything on a topic in only one hour of reading. Our books are written to give essential information in a straight-to-the-point, easy-to-read format. We have cut out technical jargon, waffle and unnecessary filler to ensure you get the essential information you need to achieve your goals with confidence.